Previously, we talked about electric motors and propellers. Uh, now we're going to zoom out a bit and talk about propulsion more generally. Um, while I'm pulling up slides, you might try to recall how do we know if a motor and a propeller are well matched? Okay, so you might remember that we wanted the peak efficiencies of the motor and propeller to line up at the same rotation speed, and we also want to make sure that's the operating speed uh, that corresponds to our design speed. Okay, so today, like I said, we're going to zoom out on propulsion a bit. Um, let's uh, first, as a warm up here, just have a, a little prediction exercise. Um, here are three depictions of a turboprop, a turbofan, and a turbojet used in various aircraft applications. Uh, I'd like you to try to guess, and if uh, try to make an educated guess if you can, which of these is going to provide the highest speed and which one is going to be the most efficient, and maybe rank them if you can. Um, and if you know, maybe think about why uh, one is more efficient or faster than the other. I should say faster is used at higher speeds. Okay, so pause and take a minute to do that. We're not gonna answer this just yet, but um, over the course of today, uh, over, this, over this lecture, then we'll hopefully have a better understanding on this topic. Uh, just by way of background, to put it in context propulsion, it's, it's been a large driver, especially in the commercial aviation space. Uh, but really throughout all of aviation. In the commercial aviation, we see this plot here, this blue curve. This is a metric we used at the beginning of the semester. We looked at fuel burn per passenger, fuel burn per seat here. Um, and this is a uh, green line is from propulsion. And we can see that almost half of our uh, benefits have come from the propulsion system uh, in terms of fuel burn reductions. The, uh, the rest has come from you know lighter structures, more efficient aerodynamics, uh, more efficient control strategies, but propulsion has played a huge role. And that's really been true from the beginning. Octave Chanute had a uh, quote in 1894 that said, the chief obstacle to successful powered flight has hitherto been the lack of a sufficiently light motor in proportion to its energy. Um, and while the Wright brothers made many contributions, one of them was uh, propulsion. Um, as as uh, that quote, illustrated this was kind of one of the main stumbling blocks at the time and what they did is actually built a wind tunnel in order to test uh, a create their own database of propeller data and in that uh, in that process they discovered that the published data at the time on propellers was actually wrong and so you know a lot of people have been basing on this published data and realized that the performance data was not correct uh, but by building their own wind tunnel and taking this new data, they're able to design some propellers uh, that were uh, efficient enough. And of course, they also designed their own motor pretty remarkably. Um, so this has played a big role. <coughs> and as we've talked about for electric motors, <coughs> it's enabling some unique capabilities uh, today. So let's try to analyze a propulsion system generally. Here's a model of a general propulsion system. Could be a propeller, could be a turbo engine, could be a, a rocket. Um, and each one of those systems won't have all of these components, but this is the general case. I'm not gonna derive this, or well, let me first illustrate what these are. So this dashed line is here, uh, maybe streamlines, or it's a, a boundary of the propulsion system. Um, if it's an air breathing propulsion system, this is the m dot a is the mass flow rate of the air coming in. It's coming in at some speed v infinity, and it's going to leave uh, the mixture of air and fuel is going to leave at some exit velocity. And we may possibly inject some fuel. So this is the mass flow rate of the fuel that's coming into the system. And while I won't derive it here, uh, the thrust equation for the system we could write as follows. It's the mass flow rate of the air times the difference in these velocities, V exit minus V infinity, plus uh, M dot of the fuel times the exit velocity, right? The fuel doesn't come in, so V infinity doesn't play a role there. And then one final term, this is the exit pressure 
minus the free stream pressure times the exit area. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is just take a minute or two, look at these terms and see if you can reason about which ones you think are largest, which contribute most, and, and maybe think about uh, which ones are zero or don't contribute for a rocket versus a turbo engine versus a, a propulsion system. So just pause and take a second to do that. Okay, so <clears throat> we've been talking about propellers and electric motors. Um, for a propeller, electric motor, there's no injection of fuel. We're not doing any combustion. So this term is zero. Um, for propeller, this is also, these are subsonic cases. So um, there's no difference in pressure. So this term is also zero. So for propeller, this is all we have. If it's a rocket, <clears throat> except for some special cases, we generally don't have an air breathing rocket engine. So this whole term is zero. Um, uh, this is the biggest term for a rocket, right? It's basically just we're burning fuel and shooting it out the back. And there will in general be a pressure difference, although this term usually is not as significant, not very significant. Um, and in fact, in the ideal case, it's zero. Now for a turbo engine, all of these terms play a role, right? The air is gonna be coming in, we're going to have some combustion and we will potentially have an exit pressure. Uh, generally though, this term is, is not a, uh, a big contributor compared to some of the others, particularly the first one. As we saw for propeller, this is gonna be zero. Um, for an engine that's fully expanded, um, for an ideal rocket, this term is gonna be zero. So in many cases, this is uh, either zero or quite small. Um, the mass flow rate of fuel is gonna be much less than the mass flow rate of air for any air breathing engine. So oftentimes this is negligible. So in many cases, uh, we're gonna write this as the simplified thrust. This is exactly true for just a propeller, but for even a jet engine, this is the biggest term. And the others are important if we wanna do a full analysis, but they're um, much smaller usually. Okay, so fundamentally, if we look at thrust, what do we see? Well, what we are doing is we're taking some uh, mass of air and we are changing this momentum, we're accelerating it. We need to uh, accelerate it through this propulsion system so that the exit velocity is now larger than the free stream velocity. That's gonna be the uh, most fundamental way this works. And again, right, there's some extra terms here, but these are gonna be small. Okay, and of course, even the second one, that works on exactly the same principle. It's just that there is no incoming velocity, but either way, we took some mass of air and we accelerated it. Uh, in the rocket case, it's just started from zero. So it's just gonna be less efficient because we didn't have something to start with. All right, so we wanna look at the efficiency. To do that, let's consider um, the ground reference frame. So what we were just barely looking at was, here's the reference frame of the propulsion system, right? Air is coming in, air is coming out. Well, it's gonna be a little easier to look, think about efficiency if we think about it relative to the ground. So we are relative to the ground, now the propulsion system is traveling by, airplane is flying by. So here's our propulsion device. It's gonna be moving at some speed V infinity. So instead of it's fixed and we're looking at the air coming in and out, now the outside air is fixed and this propulsion system is coming by. Okay, so remember before what we had is we've got um, propulsion system here. It's not moving. V infinity is coming in and VX is coming out. And now we wanna change it so that the rocket's moving. So up front, now what's happening? Oh, of course we can subtract V infinity from this. It means there's nothing happening upstream. It's just still air, right? And that's, that's what we wanted, right? We're doing this ground reference frame. So in front of the propulsion system, nothing's happening. We're moving into it. So what velocity is coming out the back? Well, basically we took this whole picture here and we just subtracted V infinity from it, right? So V infinity minus zero, that moved it to the left V infinity. We subtracted V infinity from this, that made it zero. So coming out the back, remember we wanted V exit to be larger, so it's still gonna to be to the right, but it's gonna be reduced now. So it's V E minus V infinity, all right? So this is how we can look at efficiency. Remember, what do we want ideally? We talked about this with drag. If this was an ideal system, no energy left behind, what would happen in the wake? that would mean that this term here was zero, right? 
that the propulsion system went through still air and behind was still air, nothing was left behind. This term right here represents energy that had to be wasted, right? That we had to leave this energy behind so we didn't get to use it. That's just gonna be wasted energy. Necessary waste energy, but wasted nonetheless. Didn't provide us. Uh, uh, it's going to decrease our efficiency. So um, we could write this more formally. The efficiency, uh, actually, our efficiency total for a, a gas driven engine is going to be our propulsive efficiency times our thermal efficiency. So P for propulsive, T for thermal. But for the moment, let's just think about propulsive efficiency. That's what we we're looking at the aerodynamics here, not the thermodynamics. It's going to be power out over power in, right? So power out, power in, as always. What is our useful power out? Well, it's a force times a velocity. The force that we're trying to get out is thrust, right? That's, that's the whole point of our propulsion, propulsion, propulsion system. So we want to generate some thrust. And this is at the speed that we're flying at, V-infinity, right? So this is the power to the vehicle. This is our usable power that we get out. So this is relative to the power in, the total power of the system. This is going to be the power to vehicle that's coming in, plus the power that's lost in the wake. Okay, so that's the total propulsive efficiency. That's all the power that we generated um, from our combustion from our thermodynamic um, process. We generate power and some of that's going to the vehicle and some of that is lost in the wake. So in the wake, this is gonna look like one half mv squared, but that's an energy. So to get a power, we need the, uh, a time rate, right? So it's gonna be energy per time. So it's gonna be a mass flow rate. So we've got the mass flow rate of our air plus the mass flow rate of our fuel. All of that is coming out the back. And what's the velocity coming out the back? What's the velocity in the wake? <clears throat> well, if we go back and look, VE minus V infinity, right? So that's the velocity we put here, VE minus V infinity squared. So again, what do we have here? This is our power out, and all the energy that went into the system <clears throat> from the thermodynamic either went into the vehicle or it went into the wake. So this is our propulsive efficiency. If we go back and take uh, just to keep it simpler, we could use this full expression, but just for motivating the main drivers in the physics here, we're going to use this simpler expression. If we plug that expression in here, then we can simplify this to something really short. It just becomes 2 divided by 1 plus VE over V infinity. <clears throat> okay, so that's just simplifying it. Um, made it pretty simple. Sorry, this looks horrible. This is an eta here. Okay, um, and just if you're interested, right, the thermal efficiency, it's gonna be a ratio of this term, that's what comes out versus what comes in. That's just gonna be uh, the mass flow rate of my fuel times the uh, enthalpy of my fuel. Okay, so this is the thermal efficiency. Or if it was the electric motor, this would be, a, uh, as we talked about before, right, the power from the battery, <clears throat> but for a, um, combustion system is going to look like this, right? That's an M dot, our mass flow rate of fuel. Okay, so the total efficiency is from burning of fuel out to useful thrust, but that intermediate step here is, is just highlighting the part that's lost for um, uh, in the wake. All right, so we've now got the two pieces we need to kind of understand our thrust efficiency trade-off. In summary here, these are the two equations we just derived. This was our simplified thrust equation. Remember, there are a couple more terms, but this is by far the dominant term. And this is the efficiency equation if we use the same thrust. Okay, so what do these two equations tell us? What do we want for high thrust? Okay, if we look at the equation for a high thrust, we want a lot of exit velocity, right? We want, or a lot of mass flow rate, either one, right? So either lots of mass, or we want to accelerate the exit velocity as much as we can, or ideally both. Okay, what about efficiency? What do we want for high efficiency? Well, to get the max efficiency of one, which is not possible, but let's look at it theoretically, we want the exit velocity to be equal to V infinity, right? If these two terms are equal, 
and this is one, we get two, one plus one is two, right? So we get two over two is one. Perfect efficiency. The exit velocity equals the free stream velocity. And of course that makes sense because that means there's nothing in the wake, right? But that also means there's no thrust, so it's kind of useless. Um, what happens if V exit is really large, right? We wanted V exit to be really large, right? That gives us a lot of thrust. So the bigger we make this, this term becomes uh, something bigger than one. And so then this denominator is going to drop, right? Our efficiency is gonna go down. So in other words, we've got this trade-off in terms of velocity. A bigger exit velocity is gonna give us more thrust, but a bigger exit velocity is going to drop our efficiency. Okay, so this is kind of a key trade-off. So to get high efficiency, what we really want is a small exit velocity. Okay, so uh, ideally a propulsion system is going to have a small exit velocity, but then if we need to get more thrust, our other option then, if, if this is gonna be a small increase in velocity, is we need lots of mass flow rate. We need a big capture area, right? So this way we have big propellers, or you see helicopter discs getting larger, engines getting bigger. We wanna capture more air. If we can increase this mass flow rate, then we don't need to accelerate it as much. Another way to think about this is that, um, in kind of a simple sense, uh, this, is a, this is a momentum transfer, right? Our force is gonna be related to a change in momentum. Momentum, mass times velocity. So we can either change the mass a lot or we can change the velocity a lot. From a momentum standpoint, we don't really care. But how much energy are we gonna need to use? Well, that's gonna be proportional to mass times velocity squared, right? So uh, for a given amount of energy, we actually wanna keep the velocity small and use more mass. And that's kind of what we're seeing here that it's gonna be more efficient, it's gonna take less energy uh, to produce a given thrust if we take a lot of mass and accelerate it with a small velocity. Okay, so that's kind of the ideal. Um, but here's the problem, right? That's the ideal, is that if all our propulsion systems, we just make them as big as possible and accelerate it slowly, then we can make things really efficient. But what's the problem with getting these bigger mass flow rates? That means bigger, inlets, right? Larger propellers, larger blades. What's the problem there? Well, there are a few, right? Structures probably comes to mind. Um, but from an efficiency standpoint, probably the biggest is that as we make these blades longer, right? Remember, I've got this blade spinning around. What happens as I make the blade longer and longer? That tip speed is going to get bigger and bigger. What kind of problems is that going to create? Well, that means its Mach number is going to get larger and larger, and I'm going to start getting shock waves. And at some point that means I'm gonna get really, really strong increases in drag and my efficiency is just gonna plummet. So that tends, so that ends up being a limiting consideration. If I need to fly faster and faster, if I need propulsion systems that can operate at higher Mach numbers, then I can't go to highest tip speeds. I'm gonna to have to shrink my inlets down smaller and smaller. Okay, so that means my mass flow rate is getting smaller and smaller. That means I have no choice for the thrust I need to just accelerate things out faster and faster. And that means that I'm gonna drop in efficiency. And that's just the trade-off that we're gonna to have to get. That if I wanna go high Mach numbers, that means I've gotta get smaller mass flow rates so I can keep my tip Mach numbers down and not get big shock waves. But it means I'm gonna have less efficiency, okay? So if we go back and revisit this um, plot that we saw at the beginning, uh, this is gonna be our highest efficiency, the turboprop, okay? Big diameter rotors. I can capture lots of um, mass, and so I don't have to accelerate very much. Uh, and then as we go down, right, this is gonna be sort of medium. This is gonna be the lowest efficiency, lowest capture area, so I've gotta accelerate things faster. But, of course, these are gonna be the opposite in terms of speed, right? Uh, I cannot fly this turboprop at high speeds. This is why you don't see these on commercial airplanes anymore. These were used on a lot of the older airplanes. We we're flying at say Mach 0.4, Mach 0.5. We could get away with these large diameters, but as it went faster and faster, you've got to shrink that down to keep the tip Mach numbers down, getting smaller. If we go even faster, the higher speeds, this is going to have to shrink even more. Okay, so these are kind of the trade-offs. Um, just uh, to give you some context here, turbofan. Um, 
well, I should say the turbojet and the turboprop are basically the extreme versions of a turbofan. The turbofan is kind of the middle ground. One way you could think about it is what's called the bypass ratio. And the bypass ratio is a ratio of the mass flow rate in this fan, this green section, how much comes with the fan relative to how much mass flow rate goes in the core. So some of the mass flow right here just comes outside, right? It doesn't even go through that inside of the engine. It's more like these big propellers. So the turboprop here is like a, the, the one end of that spectrum where the bypass ratio gets really large, right? Most of it is coming around the outside. Whereas the turbojet has a bypass ratio of zero. Nothing goes outside. Everything just comes here through the compressor and the turbine. Um, we could go even further, and we'll, we'll briefly mention this later. If we go up to even higher speeds, at some point, the Mach number is so high that just the shape, you know, just uh, having to um, come through this inlet and compress, compresses the flow so much that we don't need this compressor at all. So we get rid of a lot of this turbo machinery, uh, and we have what's called a ramjet. Um, and we can go even further in what's called a scramjet, it's a supersonic combustion ramjet. So it's the same kind of thing. We get rid of all this turbo machinery. We just use the shape of the inlet because it's going so fast. Um, just having you know, some of these oblique shocks is going to compress the air so much that we don't need any sort of compressor. A supersonic combustion ramjet is like it sounds. We're going so fast that we can't even slow it down. So ideally these compressors, right, or even in the ramjet, we're going to slow it down to subsonic speeds have the combustion then speed it up again. But the scramjet, we're already going so fast that we're losing so much through these shock waves, we can't slow it down enough. We just have those oblique shocks. The combustion has to occur at supersonic speeds. You can imagine that's not very efficient, right? We're trying to create combustion while the air is going supersonically, but that's what we got to do. So we're going to burn a lot of fuel efficiency is going to go even down further, but can be done. Okay. Uh, let's jump to another conceptual question here. This is going to be maybe a little tricky, but I'll try to get you to start thinking about it. And I've got a link to a video. Um, it would be uh, helpful for you to watch later. Uh, I'm not, we're not going to do it right now, but uh, if you type that in, uh, you can go watch the video. I can also post it to the Slack channel, so you can just click the link. Um, just kind of give you an overview of turbo machinery. So the question I want to ask you is, which of these blades, look, they're very, they look very different, right? And you can kind of see some differences visually. Which one is a compressor, the compressor of the, of the jet engine, and which one is for a turbine, right? And the hint I'm going to give you uh, is first, let's think about what does a compressor do? Uh, and, you know, the name kind of gives it away. Well, it's going to compress the air. So what does that mean? We're compressing the air. That means <clears throat> upstream of the compressor, there's a low pressure, and downstream there's a high pressure. So we went from low to high pressure. Think about, what is that an adverse or a favorable pressure gradient if I'm going from low to high pressure? Okay, conversely, the turbine is doing the opposite, right? We're going from a high pressure to a low pressure, all right? So uh, take a minute and think about those pressure gradients. So if I have a low pressure on one side of my airflow versus high pressure um, versus high and low, which type of airflow design would I want to use? If you look at these, you can see they're very different, right? One is generally thin, one is much thicker, one has very little camber, one has a very aggressive camber. Okay, so again, take a minute to think about that. Okay, so uh, imagine one of these, you know, either starting at low to high or going from high to low or vice versa. Which one is which? Uh, well, remember again, the compressor, we're compressing the air, that means we're going from low to high. So the fluid is trying to traverse from low to high, or is it low to high? Is that favorable or adverse? That's very adverse, right? I'm working against this pressure grade. If I'm going from low to high, I've got to do work to overcome this high pressure that's pushing me back, right? That means the flow is going to be very eager to separate because regardless of what I have to do in overcoming a boundary layer or anything like that, I've got this external pressure gradient that I've got to overcome, right? Regardless of the surface. So that means if I've got this boundary layer, I'm going to separate at like very slight increases in pressure gradient. So this is my compressor. I cannot handle much curvature. I've got these thin airfoils with very little camber. And what's gonna happen is there's gonna be many stages in the compressor because I can only generate very small amounts of lift uh, at each stage. 
I should actually explain this plot. This looks maybe a bit confusing if you haven't seen this before. If you think about like, let's go back to this picture. You can see like these blue blades here, right? This is the section we're looking at. There's tons of blades. Imagine I'm looking at the side view of this, right? And I'm seeing these blades come down. So it'd be like this infinite row. It's moving in a circle, but if I just look at one part of the circle, it's like I'm seeing this cascade of blades just come down continuously. All right, so that's what I'm looking at here. Okay, the turbine is opposite. I went from a high pressure, right? So high pressure to a low pressure. That's very favorable. Right? That means the fluid wants to go that way. It's got like this energy that's giving, it's being given to it for free, right? It's pushing it along. That means I have this extra energy. I can withstand a very uh, adverse gradient in the boundary layer. I can overcome all sorts of things. So I can have this extremely aggressive camber. Like I could never use that kind of camber for my wing. This is of course upside down because of the way the angle of attack goes. But imagine I flipped it over as we're usually using, looking, used to looking at it per wing. I could never have that much camber in a wing, right? Because it's going to separate. But if I had that wing and I had this pressure grade and I created on it, right? I just put it in this machine that had high pressure upstream and low pressure downstream and wants to push it through, then I can take advantage of that and create tons of lift, right? I can have this aggressive camber uh, really load it up, be very aggressive on uh, the boundary layer, and it won't separate. So I can extract tons of lift. Um, and so I can have thick sections with lots of camber, and I don't need as many stages. So if you looked at the figure here, right, you can see there's tons of these blue stages in the compressor, whereas this purple, or I may I have very few stages. I don't need as many to, to extract the lift that I want. Okay, so I put, I've got work out uh, in the turbine and in on the compressor. I get network because these occur at higher temperatures. We're not really going to go through the thermodynamic cycle here. Um, you know, you can talk more about this in a jet engines class. Really, I just wanted to use this as a opportunity to review this idea of adverse pressure gradients that we've talked about earlier in the semester and kind of understand the aerodynamic design that, that goes into this. All right, one last concept before I show a, a figure to kind of wrap this up, and this is um, what's called the specific fuel consumption. This is a metric that tells me, um, this is used a lot for jet engines, it says, how much fuel do I burn in weight? The weight of fuel I burn per unit time relative to the thrust that I produce, All right? So I want this to be a low number. I don't want to burn much fuel, and I want to produce a lot of thrust. So a small numerator, big denominator. This is also called the thrust specific fuel consumption and we'll abbreviate it. It's abbreviated as SFC or sometimes you'll see TSFC for thrust specific fuel consumption. So the weight of fuel burn per time, we already talked about this, right? This is my mass flow rate of fuel. So to get weight, I need to multiply that by G. And right, so this is a weight per unit time. So that's how much fuel I'm burning per unit time. And then I just divide that by thrust. All right, this is my specific fuel consumption. Um, just to help, we're going to relate this back to efficiency. I mentioned before efficiency was uh, the power out, thrust over V infinity, and the incoming one, you know, the combination of propulsive and thermal efficiency, the incoming one from the thermodynamics, we said was the mass flow rate of the fuel times the enthalpy of the fuel. So uh, what I could do is I could, uh, you could see that some of these terms are in common, right? I've got a thrust over mass flow rate here and a thrust over mass flow rate here. So I could actually um, combine these. So if I put these together, I'm going to get V infinity times G over SFC times uh, the enthalpy of the fuel. So G is a constant. The enthalpy of my fuel is a constant. Uh, this may change somewhat, right, depending on the speed I'm flying at. But the main point here is that efficiency and specific fuel consumption are, are inversely related, right, and they're uh, in, in sort of a simple proportionality here which means that, as you might expect, right, we wanted this to be low, of course, low specific fuel consumption corresponds to high efficiency, um, but they're not just roughly related, they are, you know, a, a specific formula. The units of this, um, let's think about this, right, if this was just mg, this would be a force, it'd be a force over force, it'd be unitless, but this is not, right, this is a force per unit time, right, a weight per unit time, so there's a time on the denominator, so it's a one over time unit, Usually by convention, we do these in one over hours. It's just a relevant scale. So you'll see specific fuel consumptions quoted in inverse hours. Okay, so final plot here. Uh, this kind of summarizes some of these different propulsion systems. 
we're showing how these change versus Mach number. And uh, the y-axis here has what's called specific impulse. This is exactly just that specific fuel consumption inverted. Um, it's mostly used by rockets. Uh, we'll talk about it more when we get to rockets. We'll use specific impulse. But it's, it's just a specific fuel consumption inverted. So it's thrust divided by um, the weight of fuel room per unit time. And it's really just by convention, right? Just because we tend to want to get, uh, um, you know, the magnitudes uh, in certain regions, right? So it, it's, there's nothing special about it. Like I said, it's just an inverse. So in this case, remember specific fuel consumption, lower was better, right? Less fuel per time. But here, this is the inverse. So it's thrust per fuel burn per time. So we want this to be high, right? Higher is more efficient, higher is better. So you could also think of this just efficiency, right? Higher is better. Um, on this plot, here this says turbofan, or sorry, this one says turbofan. These are really turbojets. So these are turbofans. So we're kind of stepping down the hierarchy here. Turbo props aren't shown here. They'd be at these um, lower Mach numbers. Uh, we don't use these too often anymore because we don't fly at these low speeds, but we did historically use them. Uh, they're going to be the most efficient, but we're limited in Mach number. Here, here we've got the GE CF6. This is what's used on the Boeing 747, for example. You can see we're at, you know, say about Mach 0.8. This is about where all of our transport aircraft fly. Um, and it's, uh, you know, let's see, it's going to be more efficient than some of these other options. But we're, you know, we can't get to these other Mach numbers. If we want to get into these higher Mach numbers, here, for example, these are the, the Rolls-Royce Olympus engines. Those were used on the Concorde. Uh, you know, well-known aircraft, no longer in service, obviously. Um, it actually had to have an afterburner, uh, an afterburner, uh, and that was to get through sort of that drag barrier, if you will. Remember, as you approach Mach 1, the drag went up quite a bit, and then it went down. So an afterburner, basically, you just dump a lot of fuel uh, really fast. So it's an inefficient combustion. You're just putting tons and tons of fuel to try to get more thrust. So you're increasing that mass flow rate. Um, very inefficient, but it can get you that extra thrust to kind of go through that high drag until you get to the higher Mach numbers. Uh, and as we go down to even higher Mach numbers, right, um, the Concorde was a transport one, but uh, um, SR-71, uh, a well-known supersonic aircraft, right, uh, used for reconnaissance and things. Uh, these are Pratt & Whitney engines, so we can get to even higher um, Mach numbers, but as you can see, we're continually dropping down in our efficiency. We mentioned ramjets. This is when we get rid of, you know, the machinery on the inside and just let the aerodynamics do the combustion for us. Right? Just the shape of the engine itself will deal, will compress the air enough. And then down to scramjets, right, where this is happening at supersonic speeds. Combustion is supersonic combustion ramjet. And then rockets, right, they're not air breathing, so, um, you know, this is, it doesn't really depend on what the free stream Mach number is, uh, but they're gonna have the, the least efficiency and this is like the space shuttle main engine. But of course we can get to these really high Mach numbers. And we'll talk about rockets again later uh, in the semester. Okay, so uh, that's it for today. Um, I think next time we're gonna start uh, getting into different performance aspects, uh, putting together some of these pieces of aerodynamics um, structures and propulsion to look at overall performance of, a, of an aircraft. All right, see you next time.